Good morning, Bethel family and friends. My name is Deacon James Polite, and I want to welcome you to the worship service this morning. Listen, I don't know what all you've been through on the days coming up to this day, but just know that the Lord kept you for a reason, and you are here for a specific purpose. And so let us all just get together and rejoice in the name of the Lord. Amen and amen. Scripture that I'll read today is from Romans 10, starting at the ninth verse. And it reads this way, that if you confess your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, once and again, we just thank you for the opportunity of this day, Lord. We thank you for the health and the strength that you provided us, Lord. We thank you for just putting us on your agenda one more time, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would just continue to bless the Bethel family, continue to just lead us in the right direction, Lord. Lord, we lift up our pastor right now, Pastor Franklin, Pastor Emeritus Carpenter, and anyone tuned in to this broadcast, Lord. We ask that you would just continue to just bless us Lord, and bless us in ways that we can only stand, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would just unite our congregation, Lord. As we are physically apart, Lord, let us still be on one accord. Lord, we also ask that you would just unite this country at this time, Lord. We've gone through a lot, Lord, and we just, only way we're going to get out of it is with you, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you would just be in the midst of this virtual service, Lord. Have it to be what you would have it to be. All these things we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. Praise the Lord, everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. This morning, we come to declare that we want to lift your name on high, God. So if you want to come on and bless the Lord with us, come on and clap your hands with us real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Bethel Missionary Baptist Church is grateful for the generosity of its members and viewers. You can give in three different ways to the support of the ministry. Use the Givelify app and find Bethel Missionary Baptist Church. Use Cash App with the cash tag WeAreBethelMBC or send your check and money order to 5987 Lebanon Road, P.O. Box 205, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, 37129.
Good morning, Bethel Missionary Baptist Church. It is a pleasure and an honor to be able to worship with you in this virtual space today. Pray that everything is going well with you. This is indeed the day the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Um, thank you for joining us. I want you to do me a favor if you get the chance. Please take a second to share this video, like and share this video with as many people as possible. Uh, go ahead down to the bottom of your screen, right up under the comments there on Facebook. Click the share button, uh, write a post to your friends, share it in some of your groups. However you can get this word out, please, please help us to do that. We want to touch and impact as many people with the word of God as possible. So please like and share this video. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah, chapter 2, we are uh, in the midst of, actually we'll be finishing today, our sermon series on resurgence. Resurgence is our theme for this year. We're believing God for revival, restoration, for resurgence. And so we are, we've been preaching along those lines and looking into the book of Ezra, and today we'll look into the book of Nehemiah for some wisdom and a word from the Lord according to that theme. We've talked already about what it means for us to eventually reconnect together and how we can make the most of that reconnection. We talked about what it's going to look like for us to recommit. We need the right type of servants uh, to be able to recommit to the work of the Lord. Last week, we talked about reimagining what church, what worship, what ministry is going to look like in a post-COVID-19, post-pandemic world, and that if our minds can imagine it, God can do exceedingly and abundantly above it. Today we're going to talk about the last tenet of our uh, theme for this year. It's reconnection, recommitment, reimagination, and today we're going to talk about recreate, recreating. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. I'm going to be reading from the Christian Standard Bible, and it reads on this wise. Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. It says, after I, meaning Nehemiah, Arrived in Jerusalem and had been there three days, I got up at night and took a few men with me. I didn't tell anyone what my God had laid on my heart to do for Jerusalem. The only animal I took was the one I was riding. I went out at night through the valley gate toward the serpent's well and the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. I went on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but farther down it became too narrow for my animal to go through. So I went up at night by way of the valley and expected the wall. Then heading back, I entered through the valley gate and returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, for I had not yet told the Jews, priests, nobles, officials, or the rest of those who would be doing the work. So I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned. Come, let's rebuild Jerusalem's wall so that we will no longer be a disgrace. I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been on me and what the king had said to me. They said, let's start rebuilding. Let's start rebuilding. And their hands were strengthened to do this good work. I want to talk to you today for the time that is ours as we finish up our series on the resurgence as our theme for 2021. I want to talk to you from this topic, ready to recreate. Ready to recreate. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for how you've blessed us from last Sunday until this Sunday. We thank you for watching over us and keeping us, Lord God. You've been so good to us, and we take it not for granted. We pray now, Lord, that you will be with us in this preaching moment. Open the hearts and minds of your people. Uh, transcend this virtual space, Lord God. Even though we're not in the same physical, geographical location, we know that you are omnipresent. You are everywhere. So we're praying, Lord God, that your spirit would be here in this sanctuary and your spirit would be in each and every living room, each and every dining room, and that we work through each and every laptop or every phone or tablet, whatever the mechanism we may be worshiping through, we pray that your presence would be felt in that space and we'll give you all the glory for what you're going to do. Have your way in this place. Have your way with these people and have your way with this preacher. 
It's in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Let all God's children type together in the comments, amen, amen, and amen. Ready to recreate from Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 11 through 18. Zerubbabel has completed the rebuilding of the temple in the book of Ezra. The book of Ezra, the namesake of the book, Ezra has come back from Babylonian captivity and turned the people's hearts back to God through the word of God. The resurgence effort, the resurgence project of Israel, of Jerusalem, is nearing its apex. But one more important project is left to be taken up. You see, when King Nebuchadnezzar so long ago laid siege to Jerusalem, he destroyed the protective barrier around the city, toppling the city walls and burning its gates. And when a man named Nehemiah had heard about the condition of his hometown, the condition of the protective wall, that it had been torn down and toppled and that the city gates had been burned, and he heard of the vulnerability of his people, he was heartbroken. But instead of allowing his heartbreak to carry him into a perpetual state of depression, Nehemiah decides to do something about it. He is moved to action. And when his somber countenance about the situation of his people catches the attention of the king, King Artaxerxes, Nehemiah serving as his cupbearer, the king noticed his downtrodden face and asked him what was going on, and Nehemiah took the opportunity to request permission from the king to go back home and rebuild the walls that had been torn down. And God favored Nehemiah. The Lord answered the prayers of Nehemiah, and Nehemiah embarks on a rebuilding project. He embarks on a recreation project, if you will, to rebuild and recreate the walls that Nebuchadnezzar had torn down in the past. Nehemiah is attempting to restore what has been damaged. He is not making a wall for the first time. The wall had already been created, and while damage had been done to the wall, the wall had not disappeared altogether. There was still remnants of what the wall used to be. Even more so, those remnants were something of a reminder of the former glory of the city of Jerusalem and a picture of the unfortunate reality of how far they had fallen under Babylonian uh, besieging, under Babylonian attack. Nehemiah must now take what's left and rebuild, restore, and recreate the wall so that his city can move confidently forward into its future destiny. Here's what he has to do. He has to take what's left and rebuild, restore, and recreate the wall so that the city and the people are ready to walk in the destiny that the Lord has laid out before them. Beloved, I don't know about you, but I see us in the text. I see you and I see myself. I see Bethel Missionary Baptist Church at 762 Holly Grove Road in Walter Hill, Tennessee in this text that while our church has not been devastated by enemy attacks the way Jerusalem was and churches, uh, we and churches all over our nation are faced with a similar challenge. We are faced with the challenge of moving forward into a destiny by making the most of the remnants of the church life that we have left. Before our church life was one way, we were doing things a certain way, we were doing things a particular way, and then COVID-19 and this global pandemic has caused us to completely shift how we do and how we think about church. And while there will be some things that are carryovers from the previous time before the pandemic, we are faced with taking all those little things that are left, those remnants of what we knew before, and somehow rebuilding and recreating something that can allow us to move forward into our destiny. How do you take the rubble that has been left behind and forge your way forward. Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem. He surveys the damage and he addresses the local community that is about to be transformed into a constru construction crew. He says to them, let's rebuild the wall. Let's, 
Let's get this thing done. The Lord has favored me. He's, he's given me favor with the king. He's allowed me to come back. He's given me uh, materials to do the work. He's given me permission and the blessing of the king. Let's rebuild the wall so that we are no longer a disgrace in the land. And the text says the people said something amazing. The people replied, let's start rebuilding. And I know, beloved, that we are anxious to reconnect and be back in the presence of one another, to see one another in the sanctuary, in the lobby, in the hallways, in the classroom, outside, in the parking lot. I know that many of us are ready to recommit to the work. We're going to step up in ways that we haven't stepped up before in the past. We're going to rededicate ourselves to our own spiritual discipline and spiritual growth. We're going to recommit ourselves to giving into the work of the ministry. We're going to recommit ourselves to to serving and giving of our time for the benefit and blessing of the ministry. I know that last week we were challenged to reimagine, to expand our imagination and not box God in and try to put limits on what God can do, but to allow God a room to have his way in the midst of us and blow our minds. And after we reconnect and after we recommit and after we reimagine, now we must meet the challenge of recreation. I want you to ask your neighbor right now in the comments, ask your neighbor, uh, type this message to him. Are you ready for recreation? We got to be ready, sisters and brothers. We got to be ready, beloved, because inherent in recreation and rebuilding are challenges to our efforts. Had it been an easy task to rebuild and recreate the walls around Jerusalem, It would stand to reason that someone before Nehemiah would have made some kind of attempt at rebuilding the wall. However, we must also keep in mind that God graces particular people for particular projects at particular points in time. To use the words from the book of Esther, perhaps Nehemiah is called for such a time as this. Nehemiah is indeed the man for the challenge, and I think that we can glean some things from this text to help us, all of us. We all can glean some things, the leaders and the layperson, the deacons and the disciples, the ministers and the members. All of us can get ready for the challenge of recreation. I got three things because I'm a Baptist preacher And I got three points. I'm going to hit them real quick and I'm going to let you go. Here it is. What are the challenges of recreation and how can we meet them? That's a good question. Here's the first challenge I see in the text we have to meet. The first thing we have to do is meet the challenge of materials. The challenge of materials. The city wall was constructed of stones stacked on one another. And along the wall were gates that were made of wood. And when Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon laid siege to Jerusalem, they toppled and torn down the stone wall and they burned the city gates away. The attack left Nehemiah and the crew with some raw materials with which to rebuild, but they could not complete the recreation of the wall from the stones alone. Nehemiah knew that the wall, the project, would not be complete without the gates being included in the wall. So before he left, he, he, before he came back to Jerusalem, he requested some new materials. If you read like I know you're going to do because you're good Bible readers and good Bible students, when you read uh, this afternoon in chapter 2 and verse 8, Nehemiah is granted access to the king's forest. And from that forest, he is able to receive a fresh batch of two by fours. He he receives some fresh timber, some fresh wood so that he could rebuild the gates of the wall. Here's the challenge Nehemiah is faced with. He has new wood and old rocks. He has fresh timber and toppled stone. And Nehemiah is called to mesh the new materials with the old materials, to mesh the new wood with the old stones. Here it is. Here's your first point. You're ready for it. Uh, Recreation 
will require that the present and the past be in cooperation. It will require that the present and the past be in cooperation. Present wood and past stones. The, the stones have to recognize some things about the wood. The, the, the stones have to be able to accept that the wood plays a vital role in the completion of the wall. See, even if they build the wall with the stones, the wall is not complete without the gate. You got a large wall with a bunch of holes in it. And the stones are often suspicious of the newness of the wood. Stay with me, I promise I'm going somewhere. They wonder where did this wood come from? Who, who is this new wood on the scene? We, we, don't, we don't know this wood. We're, we're not familiar with this wood. This wood is foreign to us. And the issue with the stones is that oftentimes the stones would prefer to remain a toppled wall rather than allow space for the wood to participate in the project. They are stubborn stones. But, but, but before we judge the stones too harshly, let me, let me pump the brakes and offer you that there may be some validity to the suspicion of the stubborn stones. Because the stones may be stubborn, but the wood can be a little flaky. And maybe the stones are wondering out loud, is this wood sturdy enough and reliable enough to hold up its end of the bargain for this project called the wall? Is this, uh, is this wood ready to handle the weight of what will be coming our way if something happens? Can this wood stand the test of time or is it going to flake away in the midst of challenge and controversy? Because the last time we had some wood in this wall and a fire came through here, the wood was destroyed and burned away. In, in case you haven't caught the hint, let me try to make a plane for you because I think it's that important. Um, the issue in many of our churches is that they have become battlegrounds between generations of wood and generations of stone. That the fresh wood, the millennials, the generation Z, the fresh wood with new ideas and fresh thoughts and innovative techniques and creative outlooks on trying to find uh, ways to do ministry, that fresh wood is trying to find out where they fit in the wall. And the stones, the baby boomers, the, the, the long tenured church officials, they, they, they are rigid and predictable, but they are only trying to preserve the strong foundation that the church was built upon. And while the wood and the stones are at odds with one another, the wall is waiting. While, while they are arguing, the wall is waiting. I'm gonna I'm I'm get in trouble today, but that's okay. You can send me an email if you need to at pastorwearebethel.org and we can talk about it. I'm gonna say it because it needs to be said. Uh, while the wood and stones are bickering, the stones are going home and the wood is staying home. That while things are going on between them, nothing is happening to the wall. One generation is going home to be with the Lord and another generation is outside of church altogether. And here is the kicker. They both love the wall. They both value the wall. They both love the church. They both love the institution. They both love the Lord. And one of the greatest tricks of the enemy in our churches was convincing the church that the generation it birthed was its biggest threat. The biggest trick of the enemy was convincing the church that the generation it birthed was its biggest threat. And so instead of building and blending, 
we are doing far too much bickering. And the church that both generations love is waiting to be recreated. The stones have to realize that the wood has something valuable to offer to the project of the wall. And while it may be unfamiliar and while it may seem strange and while it may seem like that's too much, uh, they are offering something that can contribute to the overall project in a major and mighty way. And the wood, the wood has to be more dedicated and committed. The wood can't flake out whenever there is a challenge. They can't turn around and and run away every time they get a no. You know why? Because there might be some wisdom behind that no, because the stones have survived some fires. The stones have survived some things that would have taken the wood out. They can be stubborn, it seems, but they are strong and they are sturdy and they are reliable and they are the bedrock and the foundation of the church and they too have something valuable to offer as well. And until the past and the present can work together, the wall will keep waiting by the, while the world passes it by. Until new material and old material, fresh wood and old stones can mess together, the church will keep waiting while the world passes it by. Until the freshness of technology and social media and innovative ministry methods and thinking outside the box can work in cooperation with sound doctrine and Christian education and evangelism and missions until they can work together. The work of the kingdom will be waiting while the world passes us by. It's no wonder that the numbers we see of millennials outside of church, that the numbers we see of churches closing on a almost daily and monthly basis, it's no wonder that the impact of the church is dwindling in our midst. Because oftentimes we spend far too much time bickering while the wall is still broken. Far too much time arguing, fighting against one another, and the wall is waiting to be rebuilt. We, we, we are going to recreate. If we're going to recreate, we're going to have to learn how to mess new material and old material to recreate the wall. Not only do we need to meet the challenge of materials, but we need to meet the challenge of magnitude. The challenge of magnitude. Make no mistake about it, Nehemiah was not facing a small task. The wall seems to be close to about two and a half miles around the city, some 40 feet tall and at least eight feet thick or more. This, this, this wasn't just, you know, throwing a fence around your backyard. And when you read Nehemiah, here's one thing you might notice. I know you'll notice it because I got good Bible readers. And when you go and read this afternoon, here's what you notice in Nehemiah, that no one comes with Nehemiah. Nehemiah doesn't bring a wave of folks along with him on the project. When Zerubbabel comes, there's a list in the book of Ezra of all the people who come with Zerubbabel. When Ezra comes... There's a list of people who accompany Ezra to come back to, excuse me, to Jerusalem. And even when they made the pause at the Ahava Canal, you may remember, he sent for more people to come with him to do the work. But when you read Nehemiah, no one comes with Nehemiah. Nehemiah has to work with what he's got, but Nehemiah has a strategy for the challenge of magnitude, and that strategy is to organize and empower the people. Read, read Nehemiah 3, you'll see Nehemiah organizes the people by having them work simultaneously, and he empowers them by giving them each a section and a task to focus on. Here it is. Recreation will require partnership. Recreation will require partnership. 
Read chapter 3, you'll see uh, and you'll get the picture that they are working side by side on this circular wall. He organizes them side by side next to each other. One group of people have a leader, supervisor, uh, a family or tribe leader who's heading up the work, who is the namesake of the group. And that group is working on a particular section of the wall. Some of them are working on building a gate and replacing a gate and others are working on re building the wall. He puts them side by side all the way around this two and a half mile wall to build it up to the place he's needed to, needed it to be. One group working next to one another and it's organized from gate to gate. Hey, this group, y'all have this section and y'all have this section and you have the next section and between this gate and that gate, y'all work on these three sections. And then between this gate and the next gate, I got people working on this section, another group working on next session, section. And so from gate to gate, all the way around the city, people are working side by side next to each other. I don't know about you, but I think this is genius. The strategy is amazing that the strategy of partnership and working together when recreating addresses the challenge of magnitude. It addresses it in three ways. Here it is. It addresses the challenge of magnitude by reducing anxiety. It reduces anxiety. Not only that, it sustains vitality. It sustains vitality. And the last thing it does, it, how it meets the challenge of magnitude, is it increases efficiency. It increases efficiency. Uh, watch this. It reduces anxiety because when the people look at the magnitude of the work, they recognize and look to the person to the left and to the right. They look to the groups to the left and to the right, and they don't have to worry about doing it all on their own, that they have, that they have to feel like they are by themselves. They don't have to worry because they know it's not all on me. Not only that, it, uh, it helps not only by reducing anxiety, but by sustaining vitality because they know I don't have to do my job and someone else's. I ain't got to put in no overtime. I ain't got to work on no extra sections. I ain't got to work all day through the night trying to make sure that the situation gets rectified and gets completed. No, I can work until I need to stop, take my rest and wake up and work again and maintain my vitality and energy. And the last way it helps is by increasing efficiency. I can focus on my small piece of the wall. I can focus on my small area of the wall and I ain't got to worry about anything else and I can look at the collective progress of the people around me and be challenged and encouraged and increase my efficiency because I'm only focused on what I need to focus on. Beloved, sometimes challenges can be so large in magnitude. Projects can be so massive that they paralyze us into procrastination. It is interesting indeed that no one seems to have tried to build this wall before Nehemiah arrived. And it's interesting because of this. The same people Nehemiah uses are the same people who have been living there all along. He does not contract the work to an outside nation or to outside people. He uses the people who have been in the presence of a broken down wall all this time and nobody until this moment decides to do something about it. The mag magnitude, the Enor enormity of the project has paralyzed them into procrastination. They have grown accustomed to being surrounded by brokenness. And it has caused them to be paralyzed. Beloved, it's, it is going to be a big undertaking to recreate the church life and the church ministry that we are believing God for in this next season. It's going to be a large task. It's going to be a tough 
project to figure out how we do church with social distancing, with masks in worship, with fever checks at the door, with vaccines um, being involved. It's going to be a large undertaking, but if we can work as partners, if we can work side by side, if we can focus on our own section of the wall, focus on our own section of the project, we might be able to do it quicker and better than what we imagined. If you read the whole story, the text tells you that they completed this enormous project in 52 days. They completed it relatively quick because they were working together as partners with one another. And God may just be able to blow our mind and do more than we imagine if we work together as partners. It's going to be tough to recreate some of the areas of your life that have been impacted by this last season and, and last year. It's, it's going to be difficult to turn some things around. It's going to be difficult to get back on track in some ways. It's going to be difficult to recover some things that you lost in the past. And the truth of the matter is you might need a partner. You might need a, a workout partner. You might need a study partner. You might need a therapist partner. You might need a fellow church member as a partner. But whatever kind of partner you get, please don't forget to partner with Jesus. Yeah, Jesus is the right kind of partner. You need Jesus as a partner in your walk. Jesus is one who has been touched with all of our infirmities, yet is without sin. He's the one who went to a cross on Calvary to die for you so that he can walk with you. He is the one who walks alongside you through the ups and downs and trials and tribulations and the fiery uh, trials and the dark days and the midnight hours and the heavy storms and all of the issues that that you go through. He is a partner who's able to walk alongside you, to bear the burden with you. Uh, his yoke is easy, the text says, and his burden is light. You can cast all your cares upon your partner in Jesus. So whatever partner you get, workout partner, study partner, whatever it is that you get to help you recreate your life in this next season, you need to make sure that you partner with Jesus. You need to make sure that you partner with the Messiah. Make sure you partner with the Son of God so that he can walk with you through all of life's trials as you recreate your life. I've done. I've been talking too long already. Here's the challenges. We meet the challenge of materials by putting the old and new together. We meet the challenge, uh, meet the challenge of magnitude by working together in partnership. The last one is to meet the challenge of mentality. Meet the challenge of mentality. If you'll remember, as we've been going through Ezra and Nehemiah, since the beginning of the resurgence, enemies have been trying to thwart the efforts of Israel. The enemies of Nehemiah are named Sanballat and Tobiah. They are not happy to see Israel making progress on the building of the wall, and they attempt to intimidate Nehemiah and the construction crew. First, they try to intimidate them with words. They, they mock them and make fun of their efforts and make fun of their work and try to diminish the work that is being done. As a matter of fact, I think it's Tobiah who says, if a fox were to walk on that wall, it would crumble under the weight of the fox. And after they try to intimidate them by mocking them, they then try to intimidate them with war. After the words comes the threat of war. They plan to attack Israel so that they would be worried about the plan and so intimidated by the plan that they will become fearful and distracted from the project. In fact, the text says that the intention of Sanballat and Tobiah was to throw the workers into confusion. Here's what they understand that we need to understand. The enemy doesn't have to lift a finger in physical attack if the enemy can confuse your mind. If the enemy can cause confusion among the workers, if the enemy can cause 
fear among the workers. If the enemy can cause distraction among the crew, then the enemy will be able to sit back and watch them implode. Can I help somebody today that has a Sembalat and a Tobiah in your life? Please do not allow the negative, negative rhetoric of those who are jealous of your progress to infiltrate your mind. All they're doing is sitting back and getting a kick out of watching you implode and go to, and go to pieces, watching you worry, watching you stress out, watching you go through all of this stuff because they said something that got inside your head and now you don't know how to react or how to move forward. Do not give the enemy that satisfaction. Do not give the enemy that victory. Do not give the enemy an inch in your life or in your mind. Matter of fact, here's what I got for you before I leave. I got to share the sermon. You ready for it? Share it with somebody. Don't tag nobody. They ain't got to know you're talking straight to them, but just put it out on your, on your Facebook wall. Here it is. Your negativity will not stop my productivity. Your negativity will, will not stop my productivity. I don't care what you say. I don't care what kind of criticism you got of me. It doesn't really matter if you think my work is not worth much. It doesn't matter if you would do it a different way. It doesn't matter if you don't think I'm good enough or valuable enough. It doesn't matter if you don't think I deserve it. It doesn't matter what you say about me. It doesn't matter how you try to manipulate me. It doesn't matter how you try to get under my skin. It doesn't matter how you threaten me. It really doesn't matter because your negativity will not stop my productivity. I'm still following the Lord along the way. I still know what the Lord has called me to do. I still know the assignment that God has placed on my life. I still know which direction I'm walking in towards my destiny. I still know that God has already made plans for me, plans to prosper me and not to harm me, plans to give me a hope and a future. It doesn't matter what you say because your negativity will not stop my productivity. I'm done. Uh, Sembalat, Tobiah, they mock the workers. They plan and attack on the workers, try to intimidate and confuse them. And here's the crazy thing, it works. It works. In Nehemiah 4 and 10, it says, the Israelites heard about the plans of attack and with the massive job in front of them, all of the rubble around their feet, with the work that they had to do and the threat of the enemy surrounding them, the text says their strength began to fail. Watch the, the language and the play on words. It's interesting when, when Nehemiah mentioned to them to rebuild the wall, it says that the Lord strengthened their hands. Their hands were strengthened to do the work. And here in Nehemiah 4 and 10, it says that their strength begins to fail. So what does Nehemiah do? Nehemiah is a good leader. He's a good organizer. He, he equips the workers to become fighters. He equips the construction workers to become warriors. And he says something powerful. When he addresses them after equipping them, he says, remember the Lord. That, that could be a sermon all by itself, but I'm gonna end it here. He says, remember the Lord. The great an awe-inspiring Lord, one version says. I like the message. Here's what the message version says. It says that Nehemiah addresses the people and says, put your mind on the master. Put your mind on the master. Here it is. This is the last thing and I'm gone. Recreation requires good memory. Recreation requires good memory. The people's strength is failing. The burdens are getting heavy. The wall seems too massive to complete. And now 
the enemies are surrounding them. But Nehemiah says, here's what I need you to do. I don't need your mind on the enemies. I don't need your mind on the magnanimity of the work. I don't need your mind thinking about anything else. Right now, I need your mind on the master. I, I need you to remember the great and awe-inspiring Lord. I need you to take a few moments to think back just for a second to what the Lord has done in your life. I need you to remember all the things the Lord has brought you through. I need you to remember all the ways in the past he's taken the rubble of your life and been able to do something new with it. I need you to remember the Lord. I need you to think about all the ways he's made. I need you to think about all of the doors he's opened. I need you to think about all of the ways he's healed your body. I need you to think about all of the ways he provided for you. I need you to think about all of the ways he protected did you? I need you to put your mind on the master. I don't need you distracted by the enemy. I don't need you distracted by the work. I need you to put your mind on the master because if we're going to rebuild this thing, I need you to be focused on the mission and the work of the Lord. I need you to be focused on what the Lord is calling us to do. And I need you to know that the same God who brought you through there is the same God that will bring you through now. The same God that protected you then is the same God that will protect protect you from Sanballat and Tobiah. The same God that allows you to rebuild your life in that season is the same God who will allow you to rebuild your life in this season. The same God who was with us when the tornado hit our building is the same God who's with us when we come back for reconnection into this building after a pandemic. The same God that was with you in the past is the same God that will be with you in the future. The same God that was with you at the creation of this ministry is the same God that will be with you at the recreation of this ministry. I need you to put your mind on the master. Focus on what the Lord has done and what the Lord is calling us to do. And if you can keep your mind on the master, you can finish the work. You can keep your mind on the master. You can complete the job and the recreation of the wall will be complete. That's not the only recreation that the Bible speaks about. The Bible also speaks about a new heaven and a new earth. That at some point in history that God will break into the timeline of history and he will call his children home and we will be summoned to a new Jerusalem, a new heaven, and a new earth, that we, we will spend time in a recreated space with the presence of God. We'll have streets of gold, they say, and, and mansions there, and uh, there'll be no more crying there. There'll be no more weeping there. The, the grave will have no more power there. There will be no more death, only eternal life. And the way that we get there is through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus went to the cross for you and I so that we might have access through the gates of this new heaven, this heavenly walled city, this new Zion, where we can access the gates because God has given us the right to interest through Jesus Christ. Do you know Jesus Christ today? Have you made him Lord and Savior of your life? Do you know that you have access inside the walls of this new creation, this new heaven that the Lord wants to bring us into? If you don't, we want to invite you to do that. In fact, we have three invitations here that we always give. The first one is that invitation to Christ. If you have not made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you can do that now. Even though you're not in the sanctuary, you can send us a message here on Facebook. And you can drop it in the comments. Let us know you're responding to the invitation to Christ. And we'll get back in touch with you and make sure you understand all that that means and give you all the tools you need to be able to walk in partnership with Jesus. The next one is an invitation to community. If you're looking for a church home, uh, maybe you've moved to this area in the midst of a pandemic and you're looking for a place to place your membership, to place uh, your um, status as a member of the body of Christ, to walk out your destiny. And you've been watching and you've been a part of what we've been doing so far and 
the Lord has laid it on your heart to be a part of this ministry. If you want to do that, we want you to respond to the invitation to community. Drop it in the comments. Send us a message. Let us know you're responding to that invitation. We'll get back in touch with you and do all we can to get you connected. And the last one is the invitation to connection. You may just need someone to pray with you. Uh, you may need someone to connect with you, to talk with. You may need some assistance of some kind as this pandemic has caused so many of us to struggle in different ways. We want to be the hands and feet of God. We want to embody the love of God to you. So if you would, send us a message here on Facebook and let us know that you're responding to the invitation to connection and let us know how we can be of help to you. Invitation to Christ, invitation to community, and then the invitation to connection. Listen, I hope you're ready for recreation. God is calling us in this season to great things, I believe, but we have to be ready to meet the challenges that come with rebuilding from the remnants and the rubble of what was. Some things will not be transferable, but God has left us more than enough to continue to do his work on into the future. And I'm inviting you to come and be a part of the recreation, the rebuilding process. Listen, on behalf of myself, on behalf of our entire church, and especially on behalf of my wife, First Lady Dr. Tori Franklin, and my family, we love you, we're praying for you, we miss you, we're always thinking about you, and we hope that all is well with you. Let's pray and give the benediction and we'll dismiss. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for blessing us and keeping us and watching over us. Lord, I pray that this word resonates with someone. I pray that this is a word and that these last four weeks are something that can help carry us into the next season, that we will not soon forget it, but that, that we will lean on these words from you, that it might be a guide and a lamp unto our feet, Lord God, as we walk into this next season of uncharted territory and uncharted church ministry. Help us, Lord God, to be faithful to your call and to the Great Commission to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, that we might take the gospel to the very ends of the earth in any way possible. Help us to do that. Empower us to do that. And we'll give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Lord, be with these, your people. Watch over them. Keep them. Protect them. Provide for them. Bless them more than they can stand it. Open up the windows of heaven and pour them out a blessing that they will not have room enough to receive. And we'll give you all the glory and can't wait to hear the testimonies of how you work in their life. Lord, you are awesome. There is none like you, and we thank you for who you are, not just what you do. We thank you that you are a mighty God, the creator of all things seen and unseen, and we thank you for all that you are to us. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the throne of grace, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power now and forevermore. Let all God's children type together in the comments, amen. Amen and amen. That's right. You got to type it three times. Three amens in the comments. Amen, amen, and amen. Everybody turns into a Baptist preacher at the end of the prayer. Listen, I love you. Thank you for joining us. I pray it was a blessing to you. And so much as so, the Lord says the same. We'll be together again on next week. Take care of yourselves. God bless you. <laughs>